Hey, everybody. We are excited to be here this morning live for our Master Garden Gardener Training Preview. So I'm going to bring on Susan DeBlee. Hey, everybody. I love that video. We're excited. I know. It makes me feel happy. The music, the, the seeing all the volunteers. Yeah. So today I am uh, Leah Feltz and I, well, every day actually, I'm Leah Feltz, fun fact. Um, and I'm your social media specialist and I'm so excited to have Susan with us today. She's the Master Gardener State Coordinator, um, also has become a good friend of mine. So I'm just excited to chat and learn from you. Um, and we're just really excited to share all the amazing things about the Master Gardener program here in Iowa. Leah, this is my first Facebook Live. Oh my gosh. We're going to write it in our friend journal. Keep track of these special <laughs> moments for us. <laughs> well, I am going to head off screen and I'm leaving it to you to teach all the things. Um, I'm so excited to hear more from you. Yeah. So in that video, I talked about how I really love the class on campus where everybody comes to campus, but we're going to try to keep people safe. And we canceled the class on campus and we're making the Master Gardener training virtual. So I just wanted to go through a couple things. One, who are Master Gardener volunteers? I think that some people think that they're an expert, but I, what I like to say is that they're people who are volunteers in their community and are focused on gardening. It doesn't mean that they're the best gardener or have some fantastic yard. It just means they like insects. They like plants. Maybe they don't like insects or they don't like plants, but they like the other one. Um, and they're passionate about helping in their community. So last year, uh, we these are the numbers from last year. We had almost 2,000 Master Gardener volunteers. So if you are a Master Gardener volunteer, leave a comment on Facebook. We're so excited that you're part of this program. And uh, those people volunteered 114,000 volunteer hours. So some examples of volunteer hours is they were building pollinator habitat with community partners um, over in the Cedar Rapids area. And all those volunteers doing all that community service is almost $3 million of giving. And so Master Gardeners are generous. They're people who are doing things in their community. A few more numbers from 2019. Yeah, that was the map of where we volunteer. And so these are the places where last year Master Gardeners were volunteering. If you see uh, a county that is white, it just means that last year somebody didn't volunteer. But we're, we're all over the state. And actually, the Master Gardener program is international. In Iowa, we started 40 years ago. Uh, this is our 41st year of the Master Gardener program in Iowa, and it's an international program. And so if you're somebody who says, I'm not always going to be in Iowa, if you move, you can still be a Master Gardener somewhere else. A few more numbers from 2019. We did host the Master Gardener training last year in person in 24 different locations and had uh, just over 200 people participating in that. And we have this really cool project called Growing Together, which here's a few pictures of volunteers uh, growing food for their community members, donating it to food pantries, and they donated 115,000 pounds of produce. So they're really making an impact in their community. And also Master Gardeners, uh, they have to keep up on knowledge. And so they logged 23,000 continuing education hours. Yeah, so what does it take to become a Master Gardener volunteer? I'm sure you've heard this term. Maybe you didn't know it was a part of Iowa State University Extension and Outreach, but now you know. And the process to become one of those Master Gardener volunteers is first, you do the training. So the training is offered in the fall. Uh, we're really excited that it's going to be virtual this year, and I'm going to get into a little bit more of those details. And then after you complete the training, you volunteer 40 hours. So you've got a 12 month period to get active in your community and volunteer uh, those 40 hours. And then after that, you become a Master Gardener volunteer. You continue to volunteer in your community. Uh, Master Gardener volunteers are usually giving about 20, they're, they're expected to give 20 volunteer hours, but they're overachievers. And so they're usually volunteering a lot more than that. 
So how will this virtual Master Gardener training work? So usually we get to be in person, we get to know each other, but that's not an option this year. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna have 10 virtual sessions. These are going to be hosted locally. And so you'll meet with a small group, you'll get to know people in that group. During those 10 sessions, you're gonna be learning about plants and insects and also playing games, getting to know the people in your community that are also part of the training. And then we've got the Master Gardener um, training videos. So these are lectures that you do on your own time. People really like doing those videos, watching those videos on their own time because they get to choose the pace. Um, they get to go back over something that they didn't quite understand. And then also each week you you're also reading a chapter about that topic. So a typical week is you get assigned a topic, you watch the lecture video, you read the chapter from the book, you meet up with your group in your virtual session and talk about what you learned. So the cost for the Master Gardener training is $195 if you are going to become a volunteer in your community. If you say volunteering is not for me, then you can do the ProHort version. We like to say that this class is really worth uh, a university class. And so the actual worth of the Master Gardener training is that $550. Uh, but if you are gonna become a Master Gardener volunteer and volunteer in your community, then you kind of get a discount and you pay the 195. When you fill out the application form online, you don't pay right then. You'll have a moment, you'll have time uh, before you have to submit your payment to your county ISU extension and outreach office. A few topics that I like to tell people the Master Gardener training is about. We cover a lot of different things. We've got a lot of great specialists. These are some of my favorite topics. So I really like native plants. I love, and so you'll learn about native plants, why they're important uh, for pollinators and what kind of native plants to grow or what kind of native plants uh, are needed in your community. Uh, we also talk about vegetables, which I'm excited that Ajay is on today because he's an expert on vegetables. Um, so you'll get to learn about how to grow vegetables. And then also, I really like the lecture and the chapter in the book that's about landscape design to just think about where to put different things uh, in the landscape, how to design a project. So this, I'm sharing a map of these are the different county offices, uh, ISU Extension and Outreach County offices that are hosting the Master Gardener training. But you don't have to be in an area to, to, to take it there. And so when you go to the online application form, you're going to see a, a long list of sites that are offering this. Um, but you can really go wherever you want to go. If you've got a friend in another part of the state, sign up to take it together. So the ne next thing I wanted to tell you about is how the is our deadline. So I like to say that our deadline is August 1st just because it's about it's a really good time to get your application in for the Master Gardener training, but we've got counties that are already full. So Pol Polk County, their registration is full. They're starting their Master Gardener training next week. But here are a couple different options. So I've got the date on here for just a handful of counties of when they start. So Mahaska County doesn't start until September 8th. So you've got time. And also um, Cerro Gordo County is starting soon on August 6th. And then I... I've got information here about when these virtual sessions are. So like I mentioned, there's 10 virtual sessions and this is the time, this is the day of the week and the time that those are going to be offered. And so if you've got questions about, you know, I'm only available on this particular day, um, feel free to shoot me an email and I can tell you which, which place might be the best fit for you. So I wanted to open it up for questions about the Master Gardener training. What are you thinking, Leah? Well, I already learned a lot. I work for Extension, and I still had some to learn there. 
Um, should we see if we can connect with Ajay out in the field? That'd be awesome. So we're going to pull in uh, one of our amazing specialists that you will get to know more if you join the Master Gardener training program. Uh, this is Ajay Nair, and he is our vegetable specialist, and he is live in the field right now, which you can tell from that beautiful sky. <laughs> And we're going to hope that um, all of the electronics work with us today, Ajay. Yes, it's working so far, Leah. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Well, why don't you take it over and share a little bit about what you're seeing right now out in your field? Sure. You know, being out in the field at this point of time with this beautiful sun out there, uh, it reminds me of a song which my daughter wa watches, you know, this cartoon, Daniel Tiger. It says, it's a beautiful day in the neighborhood. <laughs> so, so I'm happy to host you all here at the uh, yes. Iowa State University uh, Horticulture Research Station. I'm Ajay Nair, I'm an Associate Professor and Extension Vegetable Specialist. And today I want to uh, give you a, a quick uh, a tour of the uh, pepper plot. This is a pepper study, bell pepper study, which we are conducting here at Iowa State. And I hope uh, first, you know, you all are staying safe and healthy and uh, because of this pandemic. Uh, but at the same time, I feel like many of you uh, are, are getting some more time to spend in your backyards and in your gardens and you're tending to your uh, vegetables. I see more and more gardens uh, popping up all through my in my neighborhood so um, happy uh, uh, growing of your vegetables so here uh, in this pepper study we are trying to evaluate different types of plastic mulches uh, some are biodegradable uh, some uh, are plastics and uh, we want to be more environmentally sound and safe so we are evaluating them for uh, commercial production so you can see the see the plots uh, right uh, behind me uh, these peppers out there have been planted in like uh, double rows uh, 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 the two rows on the plastic mulch and they are spaced uh, 18 inches within the row and uh, about 12 inches between uh, those two rows so uh, I thought you know I'll just walk you through the field here we we planted this on the 1st of June uh, so it was a little late. Typically, peppers go in by mid-May, uh, but this year it went uh, the 1st of June, and we made our first harvest. We had our first harvest on July 24th, and uh, it was exciting. You know, we, we, we had some good peppers out there. But uh, while you are harvesting uh, peppers in, in your plot, you know, some of the things which, which you will notice, and I thought this would be a good way to uh, bring attention to those things. Uh, of course, it's exciting to harvest bell peppers, you know, nice and, and you know, Know, blocky peppers so when you're harvesting uh, what you are looking for we just harvested this morning uh, a few of the rows and just want to show you a nice blocky uh, pepper out there uh, we have two cultivars intruder which is green and red night which is red this is the intruder perfect size you know uh, great for you know like a, a dish where you can fill this pepper and, and bake uh, again uh, more blocky and nice pepper so this is what you are looking for or shooting for to harvest uh, but unfortunately uh, not all the fruits uh, come out like this uh, uh, we have challenges out in the field as well and a uh, couple of things I want to highlight uh, you might have noticed a fruit like this uh, and uh, Susan actually can pull the picture for you. This is called blossom and rot. So uh, don't feel disheartened and, and don't feel discouraged if you see a fruit, uh, a fruit that looks like this. And, and maybe, you know, 20% um, or 15% of your harvest might look like this. And so this is called blossom and rot, uh, primarily caused because of uh, two reasons. One is uh, lack of calcium in the soil and the other is irregular watering. So uh, please make sure that uh, in your gardens you tend to your crops well and water them uh, every three to four days uh, so that there's a steady availability of water. And of course, doing a soil test in the beginning will help to determine whether there is enough calcium in the soil or not. If not, there are several amendments you can add, compost being one of them, and some specific calcium amendments that can help mitigate this problem. So in addition to blossom and rot, you might see uh, something called sun salt. And this is a good example of that. Uh, 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 you can see the fruit is kind of whitish. This is more advanced stage of what the picture uh, Susan is showing you. I just picked it up today, just right now. 
and so this blossom and you can see sunken white spots and again there's nothing you can do for this because this is primarily caused by the sun but what you can do is make sure you fertilize your plants well uh, you space them properly so that the foliage is dense and the foliage can shade your fruit because if the foliage is shaded if the fruit is shaded you will see less of the uh, uh, of the sunburn uh, a few other things to highlight uh, and I was trying to look for it today but we, since we sprayed on Friday we are, I'm not able to find it. This is a pest called the tomato hornworm. Uh, they are really bad for peppers and tomatoes because you know what they do is they just chomp down the plant. Uh, you know, oh. Susan has a great picture out there for you. <laughs> They're <laughs> huge. The tomato hornworm. I'm going to have nightmares. <laughs> 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 and, and 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 you it's so it's so uh, exciting and strange the how voracious this worm is because you see it on the plant on one day and you come back two days later the whole plant is chewed down so you need to and that's act like fast. one or do you Just have a lot one of them yeah, this one can bring down the plant. Maybe 50 oh or 60 percent of the plant can be just charmed by one. You usually have one or two on a plant, but. Uh, very easy to manage you don't have to use any harsh chemicals or products uh, to manage this pest uh, <clears throat> i have this I, I thought i'll bring this out in the field here uh, this product called dipel uh, the active ingredient in this product is a bacterium called bacillus thuringiensis you might have heard this term bt uh, easily available in your garden stores you know uh, so you can buy this it's it's organic so it's not a harsh chemical so dipel is a good way to manage again bt is the active ingredient uh, typically you spray it uh, twice or sometimes maybe three times uh, in a three or four day interval and that will take care of the hornworm so uh, very easy to manage but the important thing is you scout and you walk through your garden every day to make sure you find that pest uh, immediately some other products you know again since uh, you are applying them in your backyard you don't want any synthetic harsh chemicals another product we use is called nemix which is here which is a neem based product uh, it's again organically approved it doesn't have to be the name nemix as long as as long as it has the active ingredient in the neem plant and the active ingredient is called uh, azadi ractin uh, so if you have that again easily found in in your garden store uh, you can you can spray that and manage many of the pests not just the uh, uh, hornworm but aphids which are also a problem and later on in the season when it becomes really hot out here you might see some if you might see some spider mites uh, you might see white flies uh, in, in, uh, so uh, the, there, are, there are several uh, safe products that you can apply. Uh, but typically, you know, with this growing season, I, I think uh, we definitely had a good start. We had good moisture. Uh, at this point of time, the moisture is not even across the state. Eastern part of the state has more moisture than the western side of the state. Mm -hmm. uh, but in the gardens, I hope you are watering them, uh, you are fertilizing them and scouting them and uh, enjoying them too, because you know, this is the time to harvest. The harvest season is upon us. And it's so exciting when you go out there and you pick that nice pepper or that tomato. Uh, and, and you share it with your friends, your relatives, your family, you know, it's a great time. Uh, so uh, with, do I have more time, Susan? Should I go ahead or uh, go I on? I have or? questions. Oh, sure. Absolutely. I have so many questions. And if you, if you have any questions for Susan or for Ajay at this point, throw them in the comments. Um, that's what we're here for is to ask um, for you guys to ask and them to answer. So, okay. I have questions. Sure, I yeah, am not ahead. known for my gardening skills. It is not <laughs> one of my um, highest qualities that is listed in, in, in any bio that may be about me. Um, if, if I had sunspots or the rot, could, can I still eat that pepper? Uh, a good question, Leah, about whether you can eat that. Uh, with the sun skull, you will see that the quality of the pepper goes down very quickly. It's become very soft and you know it starts rotting at that at that point you know that place so you might not be able to consume that but with the blossom and dot absolutely you just have to chop that section out okay. and you can still still eat that you know the blossom and rot what it does to the pepper you know you'll see it attacks it right in the beginning and you can see how small this pepper is mm -hmm. and it, oh. it kind of got it right in the beginning so this pepper is not going to grow big it's already no. been deficient in calcium so 
uh, th this is any, anyway non-marketable. But if you can catch this earlier, then you can end up at this stage, which is a nice pepper with no blossom and rot, you know, uh, mm -hmm. a nice blocky one. So yes, the answer is yes, you can eat them. You just have to chop it. You might not get a big pepper out of it. Okay. But how are the tomatoes looking? Some... Sure. I was just curious how the tomatoes are looking these days. And uh, it's more more questions, Leah? Do you have more questions? Or... Susan wants to know how the tomatoes are looking. And I do too, oh. because I can leave here and drive over in a minute. I love tomatoes. I can be there very quickly. <laughs> yeah. So, so this year uh, we do have tomatoes, but they are inside the high tunnel, which is the hoop house. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're doing really well. Uh, again, we haven't had those extreme hot days. We did have some, but not many. Uh, mm -hmm. Tomatoes, uh, uh, we were we were not able to plant very early, uh, but still, you know, uh, we started harvesting them, I would say about two, three weeks back. Uh, mm -hmm. they are, they're producing well. Again, uh, hongworms are also, as uh, they like peppers, they also like tomatoes. So um, mm -hmm. we are spraying Bt uh, to keep them under control, uh, but things are looking really, really good out here at the research station. Um, so for the peppers, this is something that, like, I don't remember where I heard this. So I need you to either tell me if this is a myth or or if it's true. Um, is there a way to tell, like, a, is there like a male versus a female pepper? Uh, <laughs> so Like, I uh, feel like I pepper, heard that or learned that at some point. Yeah, so so pepper has complete, uh, the, the flower is called a perfect flower, uh, which means one flower has both male and female parts in it. Oh. Uh, the male part is represented by the pollens, the pollens that fly in. And so in the case of the perfect flower, the pollen directly falls on the stigma, which is part of the female, which is the female mm -hmm. reproductive part. So uh, a perfect flower has both, and then the pollens fall on the stigma, they pollinate, and then the fruit forms. There you go. Yeah, so Look. it's a perfect flower. As compared to, you know, as compared to uh, cucurbits, for example, cucumber or musk melon, in, in that case, uh, especially in cucumber, you have separate male and female flowers. Hmm. So that's where we need those beneficials those pollinators to take the pollen from the male flower and bring it to the female flower uh, so that's why we it's very important to have a good habitat around in your mm -hmm. backyard or in your neighborhood so that you know those beneficials visit those bees those bumblebees and high bees they can come and pollinate in the case of peppers and tomatoes they are self-pollinated because both female and male parts are in the same flower Ajay, have you seen any Japanese beetles? Are you seeing any Japanese beetles, Ajay? Uh, yes, we have had Japanese beetles here for, I would say, about three to four weeks now, about a month now. Uh, they are, uh, you know, they are, they really like the plants in the rosaceae family, you know, uh, the cherries, the crab apple. They also, uh, linden trees are also a big magnet uh, for Japanese beetle. And, and also some weeds. We, we have this weed called the Pennsylvania smart weed. It attracts, you know, Japanese beetles. So they do some, some good things, you know. <laughs> they do eat that weed, which we are happy about. Uh, but yeah, uh, we do, we are do, we are having some good pressure here at the, at the research station. We are not spraying for them uh, just because uh, it's very difficult to manage them with sprays because they just keep coming. After a while, yeah. I would say another three or four weeks, their population is going to go down by itself. Three or four weeks. Just got to wait it out. Okay, well, I think um, I think we'll wait and see if any more questions come in, and uh, we'll start going to some Master Gardener training-specific questions with Susan. So thank you so much, Ajay, for joining us. It's so fun to see you out in the field and get to see some of that real-life learning that Master Gardeners will get to uh, get more of during this training. Thank you, Leah, and thank yes. you, Susan, for having me. You made me so hungry with that big, gorgeous pepper. And then I wasn't I hungry anymore when I saw the not no. so tasty looking pepper. No. Um, we just got a question that came in. I'll throw it up for both of you guys. What's the best way to handle vine borers in summer squash? Uh, vine borers are a notorious pest, especially when it comes to squash. You know, squash, primarily two, three pests, cucumber beetle, squash bugs, and squash vine borer. The challenge with this wine borers is that uh, uh, the female uh, lays the egg near the base of the plant. And as soon as that egg hatches, uh, it, it burrows or tunnels inside the stem. So oh at that point, 
any kind of uh, uh, you know contact spray if you spray an insecticide that's not going to affect that larvae because it's already inside the tunnel so <clears throat> the best thing is to avoid uh, contact uh, mm -hmm. uh, between the insect and the plant so one way we can do is we put row covers or some kind of a netting material uh, that is acts as a mechanical barrier uh, so that the uh, female cannot lay the egg but that's not always possible uh, but if you see the uh, adult uh, uh, start spraying you know because uh, you have to control it right then and there because once it lays the egg and if the egg goes inside the tunnel it's difficult to use any contact insecticide you can use systemic insecticides uh, which will go which, which is absorbed by the plant uh, but oftentimes, by the time you find that and you apply, you will lose, you know, some uh, vigor of the plant. Another way to do is you can even take a knife and open that tunnel and just pull the, gra the, the caterpillar out. Uh, it's hard work, it, it's laborious, but if you don't have many plants, if you have only a few, maybe that's an easier way to manage that pest rather than using an insect. I'm not good at hiding my facial expression, so clearly if I go into Master Gardener training, I might not be on the insect end of things. <laughs> There's some insects to love. Yeah, no, I, I, we've, I totally love them um, in, in a photo, and <laughs> but uh, maybe not. Um, yeah, that's good information and also good to know that sometimes when they get in there, you might not be able to do much. Um, is that something, Susan, that like if someone in their community had a question like that, they could reach out to a master gardener to have that information or to sure. even have so some I support? Feel like, I feel like master gardeners are, their role is they don't have to be the expert like Ajay. Mm -hmm. He's, he knows everything. Um, but master gardener volunteers know where to find the information. Yeah. So we have this awesome website called the horticulture and home pest newsletter website. Mm -hmm. And you can search it and find so many great answers from our experts. Um, yeah, I, I, I know that I get a lot of tweets that are questions about plants or, um, but usually those go to our specialists. So another yeah. way that you can get your questions answered is to email hortline at iastate.edu. Everybody hears Richard Geron on Hort Day on Iowa Public Radio on Friday mornings. Yeah. And he's a walking encyclopedia. Like he oh can tell you so many great things about the garden. So some Master Gardener volunteers are experts in a particular uh, field, but that's not what we're training you for. You don't have mm -hmm. to become as specialized um, so, yeah, thanks yeah. for sharing that. That's the Hort yeah. News website. It's awesome. I go there weekly just to get get tips and see see what's going on in the garden. Yeah, and I will also put a link for Hortline information as well. Um, you can email or call. Um, we did get a question about if the fish enjoy the worms. I'm wondering if that was the... Um, the tomato hornworm? Yes. I don't know how Do, would fish get the worm. I know. Well, my question was when you spray and then they leave your plant, where do they go? That's my biggest question. Do they just fall off the plant? Thank you, Caitlin, for sharing the hort line. Ajay, when you spray for the horn, what are they called? <coughs> the tomato horn hornworm. Worm. The tomato hornworm. Um, do they just fall off the plant? Uh, when you spray, when you spray the tomato hornworm, uh, uh, what if you spray BT, uh, which is an uh, organic insecticide, uh, the the bacteria will go uh, uh, inside the body of the uh, worm, and uh, uh, kind of you know these, there are proteins which actually uh, just uh, slow down the growth of the worm, and it just slowly and slowly dies a very slow death. It just starts stops Ooh. eating. Uh, so that's the organic way of, of <laughs> managing it. Uh, uh, but with the insecticide, if you're using a synthetic insecticide, yes, they would just drop down. You know, uh, what, you, typically when we spray insecticide, you know, you get the results very quickly. That's why with the BT, hmm. you might have, have to spray uh, two to three times. But uh, it's a biological way of killing that uh, pest is that the bacteria eat the uh, worm from inside. Gotcha. So it I looks like so there's much. a good question about zucchini blossoms. Yeah. Um, let's see the blooms. 
zucchini blooms, then blooms get moist and die. So what, what might this person be seeing going on? So it sounds like when well, there's zucchini okay, plant um, blooms, yeah. So uh, as I said, you know, uh, cucurbit family, uh, cucumber, muskmelon, squash, they have both male and female flowers. Uh, so uh, it might be a male flower that came and then once the pollens have been transferred, the male flowers will just die. So it could be either that, uh, but if they are seeing death in the female flower, and then female flower is the one which will have that small fruit at the back, like small bulbous structure at the back. Uh, if mm -hmm. you're seeing death in that, then that is primarily because of lack of pollination. So uh, the pollination did not go well, and because of that, the fruit just, you know, uh, uh, is, is uh, rotting away and the, and the flower is falling out. But, but I think it might be the male, male flower which comes, mm -hmm. does its job, provides the pollen, and just dies off. There you go. All right, well, we'll keep letting more questions come in and we can always bring Ajay back up. But uh, Susan, I have some questions for you more about the Master Gardener training. Um, some of them you maybe already answered, but I wanna make sure that we can get back to all of those important details. So for if I was you know, watching this, then maybe learned a little bit more about what um, being a Master Gardener volunteer even looks like. And now I'm thinking, okay, maybe this is for me. Um, when is the deadline? Yeah, when so I need to figure that out. I like to say that the the training deadline for the Master Gardener training is August 1st, but mm -hmm. it really just depends on who's offering it. So for example, if you're in the Des Moines area and you go to our application form, you won't see Polk County listed because they're they fill up very quickly mm -hmm. and they're starting next week. Uh, but we've got some sites that aren't starting until September. And so you do have the next month to make your decision. Mm -hmm. And just a reminder that when you fill out that application form, it's not that's not when you pay. You'll pay later. Okay. And so if you are interested, just fill out the form, get it out there, and then you can commit a little bit later. Yeah. So when they fill out the form, they use, um, and I just, I put the link in the comments so you can actually click on that link and it'll take you directly to the Master Gardener page. And right under upcoming events, um, there's some information about Master Gardener. So when they are sh filling out that application, does that then go to you or who will receive that? I get to see it. Um, more importantly, it goes to the county ISU extension and outreach staff that's hosting. So okay. shout out to Caitlin who's watching and shout out to <laughs> Donna who's watching. They are hosting the Master Gardener training and they're coming up with really creative ways to do this virtually. Mm -hmm. um, it was a, it's a big change to offer it this way, but I'm excited that some county staff are up for the challenge and finding yeah. new ways to engage people. So if they've filled out a form but haven't heard any information back, um, would you encourage them to connect with you? And we'll have your email address here at the end yeah, um, they can. or directly to their county. Either way, if, okay. if they reach out to me, I'll probably put them in contact with their county person. Um, okay. I, I think the, the county staff that manage the Master Gardener Volunteer Program, they know way better than I do oh, yeah. how this program <laughs> runs. I just like to brag about it. That's my yes. job. We have Stephen from Blackhawk saying that they've still got openings. Yeah. Till August 25th. So there's a little right. shout out for Blackhawk. Okay. Let's see some other questions. So what are some examples of Master Gardener projects or just can you maybe give us an overview of some things that you've seen county uh, Master Gardener volunteers be able to do in their roles? Sure. I'll share a few examples. And then if Stephen and Donna and Caitlin want to put in some examples in the chat box, that'd be awesome yeah. too. Um, so we have Master Gardener volunteers, like I said, that are passionate about pollinators. And so maybe they're more interested in rabble rousing and community building and partnership mm. building. How can we plant more street trees? How can we get more monarch habitat? So there's people who are Master Gardener volunteers that do that. They might not have a green thumb, but they're passionate and they want to get connected. Um, we've also got you Master had me at rabble rousing. I think <laughs> I think that's all I needed to hear is that there you that's go. my <laughs> There you go. But yeah, so and I love that you said you don't need a green thumb because so much of this is so intriguing to me, but again, I'm not known for my gardening skills, but the fact that I can 
work with local community members and leaders and maybe even businesses and talk about ways that they could better protect pollinators right now. Like I can do that. That is More definitely something be I can do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And then I also uh, mentioned the donation gardening project. So those master gardener volunteers, they do have to get dirty. They do pull a lot of weeds. They harvest pounds and pounds and pounds of mm. produce um, and deliver it to food pantries fresh so that folks get to take home this gorgeous looking produce. Mm. Um, we've also got Master Gardener volunteers who are experts. They give presentations, which might be um, more virtual now these days, or maybe they write a newsletter article. And then some other examples of projects that master gardeners do to make their community beautiful because we know mm -hmm. that's important also is they might have projects where they're working with youth in a downtown area to plant planter boxes mm -hmm. or maybe they go out to the county fairgrounds and make sure that that looks beautiful and there's a garden there um you the state fair is canceled right well, yes and no. It's okay. It's kind of like not open to the public as much as normal. But yeah, there's normally like a phenomenal display there of Master Gardener. Yeah, work. the Discovery Garden at the Iowa State Fair is really beautiful. So that's yeah, that's another place where um, Master Gardeners are getting dirty. But if you're the type of person who you say, I'm I'm not physically capable of pulling weeds for mm -hmm. <laughs> for hours, there are still other ways to give back to your community totally. as a Master Gardener volunteer. We have a few people that have commented. We have um, one viewer that is actually from Oklahoma that has um, was in Master, did the training in the 80s and has just recently repeated it. And um, he shared that they did a display at their fairgrounds in Tulsa, Oklahoma. So that's really cool to hear from another state. Awesome. Um, Stephen from Blackhawk shares that they have a master gardener orchard at their arboretum and a great group of volunteers who work at the local food bank garden. Um, and then Caitlin, she wrote so much that we have to go like this up here. No, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, but yeah, so Woodbury County, well done guys. So they did some food security work, um, school garden education for students and teachers, uh, Master Gardener help desk in the office. So that way, if somebody called their like local extension office, they had someone that could actually answer those questions right away. Um, assisting with on-site teaching, for gardening, and so much more. And most important, lots of fun, which I do think of all of the Master Gardeners that I've ever met or talked to, I think that's something we always hear is how fun it is. Like you get to meet with other people that have overlapping hobbies and interests and passions and it's really fun and um, you get to give back. Um, so yeah, those are some like phenomenal displays of those projects. Yeah. I'm um, glad we got to see the video at the beginning to see folks in action too. Yeah. And one thing that comes to mind about Master Gardener projects that varies by county mm -hmm. is some counties have a specific project that they mm -hmm. want you to work on. And then other counties are like, go nuts, be that yep. rabble rouser, Leah. Um, so it really depends on where you're tapping into and what they've got going on and where they need yeah. help. Absolutely. Okay. So talking about some of these opportunities and um, you mentioned volunteering. So do Master Gardener volunteers have to find or figure out their own volunteer opportunities or is there support for that? Um, you knew that I was going to say something yeah. about that. Did I? Um, I read the name. <laughs> I'm putting it in the friend uh, journal. Yep. Put it in there. <laughs> so it really depends. Um, some people come into the program with a volunteer project that they want to do. Maybe it's a school garden that they want to revitalize or they want to get more street trees down this beautiful avenue in their community to slow down the cars and mm. um, get some more shade going and control some rainwater. So some people bring in their own volunteer projects and then other people tap into existing projects. Mm -hmm. Master Gardeners usually put on fantastic events. We had to cancel mm -hmm. a lot of those events. Right. Um, some of them were virtual. Um, so yeah, it really depends what kind of projects are going on in the area. I did see, um, and I'm trying to remember, I kind of want to say it was Marshall County Master Gardeners that they had maybe like a plant sale, but it was kind of a drive-by. Um, and I also saw some plant sales where it was like 
um, done through Facebook where there was photos and you could kind of like claim your things there. Uh, but that's really cool too. Cause I know in our garden, there's times my husband gardens and there's times that we have more plants that, you know, uh, we maybe need to keep, or I've seen where they split, uh, hostas and are able to have those at the master gardener plant sales. And so, yeah, this year has been a little different for those oh, events. Just but a few things are different this yeah, year. Yeah, just, you know, you know, one or two, no big mm-hmm. deal. Yep. Um, but yeah, and I, we continue to see coming out from um, the the research and the specialists we have, how important it is to be finding ways to be involved and invested in something in your community right now where we are a little more physically distant than in, you know, the normal world. And so I look at this as that opportunity for people where they can still stay safe um, by doing virtual trainings and continuing education where they don't necessarily have to be um, at at a physical location if they don't feel comfortable with that. Um, And then similarly for the volunteer opportunities, you know, you're, you can be outside for so much of this um, and keeping that health and safety as a priority, but engaging with other people, learning those new skills, those things that just stimulate your brain and in ways that we all probably need a little bit more of in this weird little world we live in right now. Yeah. Um, And I think that initially when people think about this program, it's like they look at the volunteer requirements and they say, mm -hmm. okay, that's a hurdle I have to get over. And I think pretty quickly it happens that they're like, I love this. And I also know there are lots of ways that people already volunteer in their community. And so how can those projects be illuminated or add sort of a plant pollinator piece to it? Yeah, absolutely. So um, we still have a couple questions coming in. Um, So this one is as a newbie to Master Gardeners, um, they're hoping to partner with local agency that has some community work. Um, bringing people together to beautify the community space. So like you said, it's not, it doesn't just have to be, you know, a vegetable garden or just one very specific thing. It can, it can be that whole community minded look and outlook. Yeah. Make I love us that. proud of where we're at and yeah, plants, plants make us happy. There's lots of research about that. Yes. Maybe that you were talking about dividing plants. Maybe since we have to be stuck at home, divide a bunch <laughs> of plants, put them in pots and just give them away because yes. We have winters here mm-hmm. and houseplants make us happy. I can't yeah, have them in I, my office because there's no light, but. I, I'm i not allowed to keep plants in my office because they've not met good ends so far. Uh, That's Susan, okay. So. That's okay. Um, yeah, I keep them at home where my husband can help me. He's He's yeah. got the green. So big takeaways for me so far is number one, the fact that I definitely came into this meeting with you feeling like I knew a good amount about master gardeners just because of my job. And, you know, I've read some articles and whatever, but the fact that I could come in and I, I could do this, I could be someone that is community minded. I want to, you know, add that value and that beauty and that, you know, partners, bringing those partnerships together. Um, that can be something I do for my, uh, as a master gardener. Um, but I can also be, in the garden and I can be teaching and learning and sharing um, eating. I just, and eating. Oh my gosh. I forgot. We That's should have highlighted that a lot more. <laughs> <laughs> That's the real ticket there. So um, I think we'll put back on the screen really quick um, that contact information for you. If you have filled out a master gardener application and, and you haven't heard anything yet, just let me throw know. An, yeah. Throw an email to Susan. She will um, make sure to, partner you with your local uh, master gardener program leader. Um, Also, here's a couple pages you can follow if you don't already. Susan does a phenomenal job of posting um, engaging, informative, time-sensitive information on their Facebook page, which the handle's there. And also she's got a Twitter page. Um, And it's so fun. She posts some really great photos. And um, the other day it was, who's your what was your question? Your partner Who's in your the garden? Garden helpers. So we got yes. some really cute dogs I and know, a few cats and then some kids. Yes. So there it's just a fun community. Um, whether you're a you know a guru gardener or, or just kind of beginning, it's it's a great place to get resources. Um, and also just to connect with other people that are interested in some of those things as well. Um, I have also put down our main extension Facebook page and um, Instagram and Twitter as well, so that uh, you can follow a lot of the other things that we do throughout our extension work. Um, I know you said it earlier, but I think we need to give one more plug to Richard for Hort Friday tomorrow. Yeah. Um, 
So Richard Geron is the expert on all things growing plants. Yeah. Um, so you can contact him on hortline at iastate.edu. Mm -hmm. And I love tuning in at 10 a.m. on Fridays on Iowa Public Radio to hear about what's going on. And this Friday, I think it's Dr. Donald Lewis is going to talk about insects. And Leah, I'm going to bet you $5 that somebody's going to call in with a question about Japanese beetles. They're doing <laughs> everything. I... I'll I'll just pay you now because I'm sure I'm sure yeah. it's gonna happen. Pay me in weight of Japanese beetles. There you go. My goodness. All right. Well, um, if you're viewing live and a question pops into your mind after we kind of sign off here, throw it in the comments. Um, we will see that information and we'll make sure to get in touch with you with answers. If you're watching this later on um, and we're able to join us live, do the same. Throw your questions in the comments. We'll make sure to um, give you that information. I did throw a few links in the comments um, throughout. One is to the main Master Gardeners page where you will find a link to register or to sign up for the Master Gardener training. Um, Susan said it a couple times, but I want to reiterate that you are not expected to pay at the time of registration. So um, if that fee is something that you're not sure about right now, still register. You can still get um, connected with the program. Um, and then that fee comes at a later point. And uh, a couple other links, I think we put in the Hort Horton Pest News link where you can find a lot of great information as well as the link to all of our extension hotlines, one of which is that Hort line where you can get some quick answers from Richard Duran, our one of our Hort specialists. So, And Leah, when um, are you going to be live on Facebook again? Because this is see. like what yeah, you're doing I'm every day, right? I pretty, it feels like it right now, right? So our next tips from an expert series is um, August 10th. It'll be at 3 p.m. And that's with Richard and Cindy Haynes, two of uh, our two of our trusted colleagues where we ask all of the things. Anything that grows, I pretty much ask them. I've asked some kid questions too, and they've done a pretty good job of helping with that. Can uh, my kid eat this plant? Yes, right. Or earlier when Ajay talked about how that worm gets on your plant. The tomato you, hornworm. Yes. And then you turn around and the plant's gone. And I was like, that's literally, I bring home groceries and I turn around <laughs> and, yep. and the four-year-old has taken it. I don't know how, but it's magic. I brought home a dozen nectarines yesterday. They're gone. Oh my gosh. And they drop them or take one bite too. And I'm like, Ooh. <laughs> all right. Well, uh, again, any questions, any information we can provide you with that um, you no, throw it in the comments and we will get back to you. Susan, it was a pleasure meeting with you and learning Good more. To see about you. That. I know the IO Master Gardener program. All right, everybody, we're going to sign off. You guys have an amazing day. Yay. <laughs>